This presentation will cover the history of integrating segregated public libraries in Northern Virginia, including Fairfax County Public Library. We'll start off with Fairfax County Public Library and then move on to the surrounding jurisdictions. About five years ago, the Virginia Room first started receiving the question, were Fairfax County Public Libraries ever segregated? And up until 2021, for an answer, we would have pointed you to Bernice Lloyd Bell's 1963 thesis entitled, Integration in Public Library Service in 13 Southern States. As a library grad student, Ms. Bell, pictured here, had sought to discover if progress had been made in making public library facilities available to Black residents in the South since the early 1950s. She sent out a six-page questionnaire asking a range of questions about integration to 290 libraries, including Fairfax County Public Library, who responded to her. Bell compiled some of the survey's answers in a table, which you see here. FCPL responded as always being open to all races. The 1954 Supreme Court case Brown versus Board of Education, which overruled separate but equal doctrine, had no influence on FCPL's decision to open up library facilities as they were already open to everyone before that case's ruling. FCPL also replied, that it was generally known that black citizens had free access to the library and its branches. However, no special efforts were made to inform those residents of the services available to them. Now, although FCPL positively responded to Bell's survey as always being open to everyone, this was in fact not always the case as you are about to see. Prior to the establishment of FCPL in 1939, individual communities and towns in Fairfax County form their own libraries without any professional assistance. There were six known small libraries. The Fort Knightley Club Library of Herndon was the first library established in the county in 1889. There was the Vienna Town Library. Falls Church had a library. McLean had a library. There was the Forestville Community Library, which today is known as Great Falls. And there was also the Fairfax County Library, not to be confused with FCPL. Every single one of these community libraries only served the white residents of Fairfax County, including when they partnered with FCPL as unofficial branches in the 1940s. Black residents were not allowed access to them. After a decade of community efforts, the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors voted to establish Fairfax County Public Library on February 1st, 1939. The judge of the circuit court appointed a library board of trustees of local citizens one of whom was required by state law to be the superintendent of Fairfax County Public Schools, Wilbert T. Woodson. This is no longer the case for the library board. FCPL solicited assistance from the state library board and the Works Progress Administration, the WPA, who donated and loaned a bookmobile with 1,000 books and financed the salaries of the staff. The Board of Supervisors built this small cinder block building behind the Fairfax Courthouse to house the collection and the bookmobile in the summer of 1940. Before that building was built, though, at the third board meeting of the Library Board of Trustees held in September 1939, the trustees met with representatives of the existing community libraries and discussed how they could all cooperate together. A series of statements made at the meeting were recorded, one of which was, Quote, books allocated and marked for colored readers will not be available to white readers and vice versa, end quote, which meant FCPL was going to have a segregated library collection. No further discussion occurred about offering service to black residents until the eighth meeting of the library board on July 22nd, 1940. This was the second meeting since the hiring of the county librarian, John Mailer. The first topic of discussion was his suggestion that FCPL provides service to black residents. One of the questions posed was, if it was to be offered, what type and how much service should be provided? The board minutes recorded here that they agreed to offer it because none of the books from the partnering segregated community libraries could be lent out to black residents. The Extension Division State Library planned to furnish FCPL with 400 children's books, 100 books for high school age students, and 50 books for adults. So essentially, FCPL would maintain a segregated book collection. Despite previously approving service to Black residents, the question came up again five months later at the library board meeting in December 1940. By then, 
the board had appointed a new county librarian, Dorothea Asher. The minutes reported it was again agreed to provide service to the county's black residents and that books for their use had been loaned to FCPL by the Virginia State Library Extension Division. Asher established a Fairfax colored, and that was the terminology used at the time, deposit station, and made a contact to establish a Falls Church colored station by the following board meeting on January 14, 1941. FCPL's deposit stations were typically placed either in homes or stores, and the bookmobile would drop off books, usually on a monthly schedule. During its first month of operation, the Fairfax Colored Station had four adults and two children register as FCPL borrowers. The Falls Church Colored Station was up and running by the following month. The exact locations and conditions of these two deposit stations are unknown. The Black residents of the county had access to library books only through those two deposit stations. Conversely, white residents who you see here in 1945 using the FCPL bookmobile could obtain library books and register for library cards through multiple bookmobile stops, deposit stations, school library branches, and community library branches conveniently placed throughout and around the county. Surviving library records do not indicate if any additional bookmobile deposit stations or stops were ever established specifically for the Black community in the 1940s. The oldest complete bookmobile schedule that survives dates from 1945. And by then, the Fairfax and Falls Church colored stations are no longer listed, nor any other segregated stations or stops. By the early 1950s though, FCPL bookmobiles had started making scheduled book deposit stops at four segregated Fairfax County public schools. FCPL began recording library statistics in November 1940. When service began for the county's Black residents at the Fairfax Colored Station two months later, statistics were kept for the registrants and the type of books circulated to the Black community. These statistics were maintained for less than a year, ending in October 1941. For subsequent monthly reports, designated columns for the Black statistics were left blank and the white statistics were written over them. And this is an example of one of the surviving record forms that we have for circulation records. And as you can see here, how much better the white community was served than the black community. This is also the, an example of a borrow registration form that we have from that era. And again, the numbers kind of speak for themselves. In addition to not being able to access a book deposit station or the bookmobile itself, as previously mentioned, Black residents could also not access the independent community libraries. Surviving FCPL monthly records for partnering community libraries confirms this. The monthly record form had a prompt asking whether service was provided to whites, blacks, or both. All extent forms that we have from 1942 to 1943 were answered as white only. Grids designated, which you can see here for what they called Negro borrower registration statistics, are left blank or crossed out on every monthly record for every partnering community library. Beginning in 1944, the Extension Division of the Virginia State Library began publishing annual statistics of all public libraries in the state. They mailed out surveys to every public library and compiled the resulting data in an annual report. For their 1944-45 and 1945-46 reports, the Extension Division designated a service to Negroes column in their table of statistics. A check mark indicated whether a system's main library or its branches served the black community. In the 1944-45 report, Margaret Edwards, the county librarian reported that FCPL did not provide service to black residents, which you can see illustrated here. However, in the 1945-46 report, newly appointed county librarian Ruth Ashburn stated that the main branch did provide such service. Subsequent Virginia State Library reports no longer designated such a column of statistics, presumably because of a new law passed as chapter 170 of the 1946 Acts of Assembly, which required libraries who received state aid to serve all residents. That law, still applies in the Code of Virginia today. 
Due to the vagueness of the language made available, many libraries in the Commonwealth could still get away with segregated library service. FCPL did, however, help establish a library in Bailey's Crossroads specifically to be used by the community's Black residents. This was not an FCPL branch. During the summer of 1947, Ruth Ashburn, the county librarian, in conjunction with the Bailey's Crossroads Summer Playground and other county agencies, sponsored library service to be provided at the Bailey's Colored School. School officials agreed to have the facility open for library service throughout the academic year. A door knocking campaign resulted in adding more than 100 books to that library's collection, and Ashburn promised to loan additional FCPL books if circulation justified it, although there isn't any documentation indicating this ever occurred. And this is a picture of where that library was. From 1939 to 1950, FCPL only provided bookmobile service and did not have a publicly accessible library building. In February 1950, that all changed when the Cinder Block FCPL building in Fairfax received an addition and opened to county residents for the first time ever. And this is a picture of that building. We don't know if Black residents could come into the library at that point. There isn't any documentation, nor do any longtime Fairfax County residents that we interviewed remember. Two years later, the State Library surveyed the conditions at FCPL and published a rather scathing report about how deficient its operation and services were. It was bad. The report made no mention if Black residents had access to the library, but it did make the recommendation that, quote, the headquarters library should be open to all residents of the county wherever they live. Indeed, failure to do so is a violation of one of the requirements made by the State Library Board of Public Libraries receiving state aid, end quote. Following the publication of the state's scathing 1952 report, the library board appointed Mary K. McCullough, pictured in the center here, as Fairfax County Library Director in July 1953, whom they tasked with reorganizing FCPL. Less than two weeks on the job, she immediately closed the library to the public for six months for complete inventorying, reorganization, and remodeling. After six months, in January 1954, the headquarters library reopened, bookmobile service resumed, and FCPL's first branch, Thomas Jefferson, opened to the public in Falls Church in the rear of the family barbershop in the Graham Road Shopping Center. We unfortunately don't have a picture of this branch when it was operating in the Virginia room. Uh, this is the next best image we have. This is what it looks like today. The former barbershop is now a dentist's office. The Friends of the Thomas Jefferson Library created flyers promoting its open house on January 9th, which invited everybody and offered a card for everyone who could print his own name. After the opening, a fundraising flyer issued by the Friends declared the branch, quote, open free of charge to all residents of the area. The Fairfax County Sun Echo newspaper also confirmed the library's inclusiveness in May 1954, saying, quote, it may be used by all county residents free of charge, end quote. Now, although the library had its own private entrance at the back of the white-owned barbershop, it is unclear if Black residents would have felt comfortable using it or if it was even accessed by the Black community during its entire year of operation in that storefront. All of the longtime Black residents that we interviewed as a part of this project said they never used FCPL libraries in the 1950s or remember even having the bookmobile come to their neighborhood. The library experience was primarily through the school system, is what many of the residents told us. After TJ's opening between 1954 and 1961, five additional branches opened. No documentation exists recording what SCPL's policies were when opening these branches or if they were truly open to everyone. Pre-1962 library policy documents are presumed destroyed, FCPL annual reports never noted any discriminatory policies, nor is there any discussion concerning segregated facilities in the Library Board of Trustees minutes. Historical photographs of these library buildings do not feature any kind of discriminatory signage indicating segregation either. A Washington Sunday Star article from February 24, 1957 is the earliest recorded instance 
that explicitly stated SUPL was open to both whites and blacks. It seems likely that following the State Library's 1952 scathing report, the hiring of Mary McCullough in 1953, and the reopening of the headquarters library and Thomas Jefferson branch six months later, that FCPL quietly allowed everyone into library facilities. Although never explicitly mentioned in the Library Board of Trustees minutes or other records, inclusive language is used in FCPL brochures and other in-house board documents throughout the mid-1950s and onward. Now, while the previous five FCPL branches and main library were definitely desegregated by 1957, Patrick Henry Library in Vienna was the first branch explicitly established with the purpose of being accessible to all residents of the town of Vienna. Up until its opening in 1962, Vienna's Black residents were barred from using the only library around, the Vienna Town Library. Today, it's a museum. You can actually go check it out. It's uh, open every first Sunday of the month. Their 1913 charter explicitly stated that the library would only serve the town's white residents. The Vienna Library Association always held themselves aloof from FCPL and refused to abide by the library board's policies and requirements in order to receive book bill bill service as a community library. They also later resisted pressure to assimilate into an FCPL branch library. The community's frustration with the association reached a climax in the 1950s because of an incident with the Carter family. William McKinley Carter, a prominent black citizen of Vienna, was a retired IRS employee and his family had been living in the Vienna area since 1842. He was a charter member of the Fairfax County branch of the NAACP. At some point in the 1950s, a white woman checked out books from the Vienna Town Library for Carter's children, and they brought them home. Once the Vienna Library Association's Board of Trustees found out the Carter children had the books, they went to Carter's house and demanded them back. And that's William Carter pictured there in the middle there. In 1958, outraged citizens met in William Carter's living room and informally established the Friends of the Library of Vienna, Virginia, a biracial organization that sought to establish an FCPL branch in Vienna that would be open to everyone. To make a really fascinating and long story short, after a three-year effort led by the Friends, which was enthusiastically embraced by the Vienna community and FCPL itself, the Patrick Henry Library opened in the Vienna Shopping Center storefront in 1962. The Vienna Town Library never recovered and actually made way for the current site of where Patrick Henry Library is today. And that is an abbreviated recap of what FCPL was doing during the segregation era. Over now to Suzanne LaPierre for what the other library systems in Northern Virginia were doing. This is Suzanne LaPierre. I'm one of the other librarians in the Virginia room. Chris and I divided this research into two parts. While he was working on the history of Fairfax County, I was looking at the other parts of Northern Virginia and some examples from elsewhere in the state for context on this issue. So that is part two of this presentation. For the purposes of this report, we are defining Northern Virginia as the counties and cities that share a border with Fairfax County. Probably the best known example of attempted desegregation of a library system in Northern Virginia is the case of Samuel Tucker in 1939 in the city of Alexandria. Mr. Tucker was born and raised in Alexandria, graduated from Howard, sat for the bar exam at the age of 20 and passed it without ever having been to law school. And he lived just a block and a half from the city of Alexandria library system, which became public in 1937. In 1939, he sued the library because he was unable to use it because of his race. And while this lawsuit was working its way through the court, he also planned a protest that was the first of its kind. They didn't really have a word for a sit-in in 1939. They called it a sit-down. These young men who you see on the left were recruited by Mr. Tucker to go into the library one at a time, request to open an account, and each one was denied because of his race. So he proceeded to 
take a book off the shelf and sit in the library and read. There was also a 14 year old lookout whose job was to run and get Tucker when the um, police had been called so that Tucker could then alert the press to get these photographs that we have um, like the one on the left. Well, this did not result in the library system being integrated. It resulted in the city of Alexandria hastily erecting a segregated library for black citizens called the Robinson Library. And Mr. Tucker was not at all happy with this result. He really wanted the main library to be integrated. However, that did not occur until 1960 for adults and high school students. And it was not until 1963 that the children's services also moved from the Robinson Library into the main library. So Mr. Tucker was definitely a man ahead of his, ahead of his time. And now we recognize him as such. And this pin that you see on the right is in the collection of the Virginia Room commemorating the 80th anniversary of the Alexandria Library sit-in. The Loudoun County Public Library was preceded by the Percival Public Library, which is that charming stone building that you see there on the left. It was the only public library in Loudoun County for many decades prior to the establishment of the Loudoun County Public Library system that we know today. And it was a library for white residents only. There were no services to black residents. There was not a separate library. There was not a bookmobile. So this library was doing nothing to um, comply with the state mandate that they serve all residents. Until 1957, thanks to the efforts of Samuel Cardoza Murray and Josephine Cook Murray, a local couple who owned an upholstery shop, and had received a commission to do some interior design work for the sister-in-law of the president. So Mamie Eisenhower's sister, um, Mrs. Mike Moore, had asked them to make some Austrian style draperies for her home in Hillsboro. And they were not sure how to make Austrian style draperies, so they went to the library to do research and they were not permitted to check out a book because of their race. So they sued the library and there was much drama from the segregationists calling themselves defenders of state sovereignty and individual liberty. Uh, but in the end, the library was compelled to um, integrate or they would lose their funding because they were not complying with the mandate that they serve all residents. So after the Murrays um, were successful in desegregating the library system, they finished their interior design work for Mrs. Moore, and the Eisenhowers were so impressed with the work that they had done for Mamie Eisenhower's sister that they requested that the Murrays do some work for their home in Gettysburg. So if you go to the Eisenhower's home in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, which is open to the public as part of the National Park Service, you can still see these Austrian style draperies in some of the rooms that was what the Murrays were researching when they went to the library and encountered the segregation. So you can see them in this photograph here as well. The Arlington Public Library became public in 1927 and the Holmes branch opened in 1944 to serve black residents. When it was forced to close in 1949, no other location could be found and therefore the Arlington Library quietly integrated its facilities in 1950. We found this to be the first example of a previously segregated library system that integrated in Virginia. However, because there was no pro protest or lawsuit involved, it's not often recognized as such. I won't spend too much time on the city of Falls Church Library because Chris already talked about this when he was talking about the community libraries that existed before FCPL. I just want to say that um, if you read books about the Mary Riley Stiles Library or look on the website or talk to the staff, you will not find any indication that it was ever segregated. But Chris found documents in our archive that show that it was. So this is just an example of how deeply buried some of this history is. In Prince William County in the late 1800s, a former slave by the name of Jenny Dean established the Manassas Industrial School for Colored Youth, later known as Manassas High School. This was the only high school in the region available for black students of high school age for many decades. Andrew Carnegie donated money to the school for the building, uh, Carnegie Building in 1910, which housed a library. 
and it was stipulated that this library should be open to members of the public. So it was essentially the first public library in Prince William County. And if you go to the site today, you'll see a statue of Jenny Dean with the surviving arch and footprint of the Carnegie Building. And now we're going to take a look at a few other examples in Virginia just for context on this issue. As you can see from these statistics, um, which are elaborated much more in our full report, um, the situation was pretty dire for, for um, black residents when it came to having access to library services. In 1944 to 1945, only 26 of the 86 public libraries in Virginia reported some type of service to black residents. And that didn't mean that the main library was integrated necessarily. It could have been a bookmobile or a separate segregated branch. So um, we're going to take a look at some of the more notable um, cases that made the news from other parts of Virginia. If you are familiar with Danville, Virginia, you might have heard it called the last capital of the Confederacy. And that is because of events that took place in this building that you see here on this old postcard. This uh, was an old mansion called the Sutherland Mansion, and it was used by Jefferson Davis to hold his last cabinet meeting of the Civil War. Well, this building became a public library in 1928 for white residents only. Black high school and college students and other activists um, succeeded in forcing it to integrate in 1960. However, when the building opened as an integrated facility towards the end of 1960, they had imposed a standing only situation by removing all of the tables and chairs from the building so that people of different races could not be seated together. And they had, uh, instituted a four page long library card application asking all kinds of nosy, nosy questions about what is your level of education? Why do you want to use the library? What hours might you be using the library, et cetera, et cetera. And you had to have two character and two credit references as well as pay a $2.50 fee to use this public library. So even though it opened as an integrated facility in 1960, it was far from a welcoming environment, as you can imagine. In Newport News, Virginia, Mr. William Hale Thompson, an attorney, was largely responsible for integrating the library system in 1952. And if you visit Newport News today, you can see his likeness uh, created on the side of what was his former law office, which is now a barber shop. In Petersburg, Virginia, there was another old Southern mansion that was donated to the city for use as a public library in the 20s. And it was stipulated in the deed that one floor would be for white student, uh, residents and the other for non-white residents to use. Well, back in the 20s, that was meant to facilitate access, but in 1960, it was no longer um, an acceptable situation and um, protest by black high school and college students, as well as other citizens led by some of the reverends in the area succeeded in integrating the building in 1960. Uh, one of the organizers of that effort was Reverend Wyatt T. Walker, who you see um, in the lower right there. He later became the chief of staff to Dr. Martin Luther King. And that's Lillian Pride, a college student at Virginia State College, who you see in the center being served with an arrest warrant. In the city of Portsmouth, we have two dentists who sued the library system to integrate. They were Dr. Holly, who you see on the left, who later became the first black mayor of Portsmouth, and Dr. Owens, who later became the first black rector at ODU. As you can see from these examples, it was really black citizens turned activists who were, were responsible for desegregating public libraries that were ignoring the law. Up in the corner there, you see Teresa Ann Walker. She still lives in Virginia today. She was one of the library protesters in Petersburg. In fact, she was in the children's area with her own children and the children of another protester uh, during the, the, the sit-in. And the police approached her and said that she could be arrested. Her response was, I came prepared. And they then did an about face and said, oh, well, we're actually, we're not going to arrest you because we don't want to humiliate the children. So as you can imagine, that would have been a PR nightmare. 
So she has recently given um, an interview to the Washington Post about her time as a freedom writer. So I think it's important to realize that this is not ancient history and there are still people living here today who have experienced this. Virginia library associations and um, indeed national library associations were quite passive during the, uh, the Jim Crow era and the segregation of libraries. Um, unfortunately, um, there was a lot of sort of both sidesism, um, as we see in some of the documents that we have from the Virginia Library Association. There was sort of this, uh, one of the speakers that they had at the conference said that, well, segregation is, is wrong, but you know, it's also a deep seated custom in the South and we don't want to rock the boat and this kind of thing. And um, you can read more about that in our report. Um, the ALA created the Library Bill of Rights in 1939, just a few months before Samuel Tucker's protest of the, seg of the segregated facilities um, in Alexandria. And uh, nobody in the library uh, world came to his defense. It wasn't until 1961 that the ALA added the non-discrimination based on race clause to the Library Bill of Rights. And 1961 was after all of these cases that we've just talked about where black residents were arrested, harassed, spent their own money on lawsuits to gain access to their public libraries. So it was a little too little too late from the ALA and the Virginia Library Association. In conclusion, I'd like to address a couple of the questions that we got from the library board when we started this research. One of them was where libraries were not segregated, were there other limits in place? And I think we've addressed that a little bit um, so far. There was a lot of implicit segregation, even where it was not explicit. Much of this was due to the segregation of neighborhoods, which um, was really rampant until the, um, the uh, 1968 um, Fair Housing Bill passed. Uh, so there was just um, a lot of evidence, including firsthand accounts, oral histories, um, and statistics on how many people of which race entered the libraries after they were integrated that show that black residents did not necessarily feel comfortable entering these formerly segregated libraries simply because they had been legally required to integrate. Um, and I will refer you to that quotation up in the red area. People not only don't go where they aren't welcomed, but people also many times don't go where they were not used to being welcomed in the past. That is a quotation from the first black uh, staff member at the um, Thomas Balk Library in Loudoun County. He worked there for a couple of years in the 60s and said he never saw another black resident using that library. And we have other examples in our full report. The second question was, how did many libraries remain unsegregated while schools were segregated? Well, looking at newspaper editorials and articles from the time, we see that segregationists were um, determined to save all of their strength for the massive resistance movement against school integration. And because of that, they were often willing to let public libraries and other facilities go. Um, in fact, in this article that you see on the right um, called The Silly Side of Segregation, the author is writing about the Percival Library situation in Loudoun and saying that this is the only library in Loudoun County. Of course it should be integrated. It's silly for it to be segregated. But then the writer goes on to say, well, now schools are another matter. Schools require a more intimate, prolonged relationship um, and therefore they should remain segregated. So um, in, in some ways the, um, uh, it was like a bone thrown to the, uh, or a way of them of to make themselves look progressive. Hey, yeah, oh, sure, we're for integration of libraries, while still trying to keep schools and other um, uh, and some other um, places like swimming swimming pools um, segregated. Their rationale was that the um, the more relationship in schools was more intimate and prolonged, um, and also that. Um, students were required to attend school, but people are not required to use the public library. 
We hope that you will take a look at the full report because there is so much more detail that we can't go into with this presentation, which is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, please see the appendices also in that report. We have a timeline of events with Fairfax County events in blue so that you can compare what was going on here with the rest of the state and the country. Uh, Appendix B is a, a compilation of um, short biographical sketches of the Black Virginians who were instrumental in desegregating Virginia's public libraries. They really deserve our recognition today, so please do take a look at that. Appendix C, uh, Chris and I spent some of our time off visiting the existing libraries and other sites and landmarks that um, we touched upon in our research, and you can see photos that we took in Appendix C. And Appendix D is a list of black librarians in Virginia public libraries in the fall of 1947. So we do hope that you will uh, take a look at the rest of our research in the report, and um, you will also find there the image captions and credits for these slides. We do hope that this research will inspire others to add more pieces to uh, tell a fuller version of our history. Thank you for listening.